Good morning, everyone. So our aim today is really a bite-sized introduction to software patenting. And we're, we've aimed this so that hopefully it can be understood by people who don't have too much knowledge of patents. So I, I think there are a few lawyers in the audience. So I just want to get my apologies in now. We have blurred over some of the more complex areas of the law just to try to make it a bit more understandable. So I'm going to start us off today talking through the more theory side of how to patent software. And I'll be hanging, handing over to my colleague, Theo, who will talk you through some practical examples. Something I've often heard people say is that you can't patent software. I've heard people get strangely angry about this point. And unfortunately for them, that's not correct. So today's message, if you take one thing away, is that you can patent software. If you've come up with some great new computer program, don't rule out patents straight away. Do consider them. The truth is somewhat more nuanced. This is actually quite a complicated area of the law. So the, the truth is you can patent some software. It depends on the type of software, the application of that software. Unfortunately, some other software you might not be able to patent. And the aim of today is to try to show you the kind of areas where you can patent software and the kind of areas where you might have to look elsewhere. So before we get into that, it's worth considering why this is all such a complicated area. So modern patent law, in Europe at least, started in 1973. And that's when we got what's called the European Patent Convention. It sorted out a European patent system that pretty much every country in Europe is part of. Little side note here, the European patent system is entirely separate from the EU. So the UK is going to remain a part of the European patent system going forwards. So thinking about 1973, this was the state of the art for computers. You can forgive the legislators in 1973 for not imagining a world where pretty much everything is controlled by computer programs. So they wrote the law in such a way that is not all that helpful for today. So what does the law say? How do you get a patent? Well, every application for a patent is going to have to meet two hurdles. The first is novelty and the second is inventive step. Novelty means you have to have an invention that's different from everything that's already known. An inventive step means it has to be different in some kind of clever way. Now, if you've got an invention in the mechanical arts, that's pretty much all you have to consider. Get over those two hurdles, you'll get a granted patent. But there's actually a first hurdle that only really comes to the fore when you're talking about things like computer programs. And that we call excluded subject matter. The law says there are certain areas of technology that are just not eligible for patent protection. We call those excluded subject areas or non-technical areas. So to get a patent, you actually need to show firstly that you're in a non-excluded area, you're in a technical technology area, you're novel and you're inventive. So what I have here is a kind of representation of different technology spaces. In the middle, in the green, we have the patentable area, the technical area, the non-excluded area. This is where you're going to find your car engines, your wind turbines, your big clunky machinery that the patent system was really set up to protect. And around the outside, in the red, we have all of the areas that the law says you can't have a patent for. So you'll find here a method of doing business. You can't have a patent for running your office better. Aesthetic creations. Unsurprisingly, you can't get a patent for a work of art. Scientific theories and mathematical methods. So abstract science and math, you can't get a patent for. With the key word there being abstract. Presenting information. So for example, this figure here can't be patented, unsurprisingly. And most relevant for us today, computer programs. But what that law says is that computer programs as such are excluded. 
And that as such is all important. Because that means that to be excluded, you have to be solely in one of those red areas. If you can say that actually you're in some kind of overlap of technology area, so that you have some some practical way of working in a technical non-excluded area, you make it into one of the gray areas on this figure, then you might be able to get a patent. So what that means is, for example, if you're a computer program, but it's a computer program that runs some piece of machinery, then you're probably going to be in that big gray area and you may well be able to get a patent. One thing to note is you can't escape these exclusions just by moving to another red area. So if you have a computer program that's just implementing a mathematical method, you're still in the red, you still can't get a patent. But if it's a mathematical method on a computer program with some practical application, then you may well be able to get a patent. Now, what kind of computer programs are going to be patentable? Well, in the UK, the courts have given us some kind of signposts of the kind of computer programs that might be patentable. So here we have them across the screen. Just to cover them quickly, the first signpost is what I already mentioned. It has some kind of technical effect outside of the computer. The second signpost, are you operating at the level of computer architecture? Have you got some computer program that's making the hardware of the computer run better? If you have, you may be able to get a patent. The third signpost is, does it make the computer work in a new way? Or is it just the same old way that a computer works, maybe a bit faster? The fourth signpost, do you make the computer work better in the sense of being a more efficient, more effective computer? So this is really, again, thinking about the computer as a machine, a machine that runs apps, say. If you make that machine better at some fairly low level, then you probably can get a patent. And the fifth signpost is a little weird. It's have you overcome a technical problem, a problem in a patentable area, or have you just circumvented it? So an example of this would be if you find that your problem is a limitation in bandwidth, have you dealt with the problem of bandwidth limitation, or have you reduced the amount of data that you're sending? Reducing the amount of data would be sidestepping that problem, not overcoming a technical problem. So that's a very quick overview. This is what it is. If you can get out of that computer program exclusion and say that you have some application, either in running the computer better or in some other patentable area, you may well be able to get a patent. This is now, these are just quick. these are just headlines, so don't be. And there's a lot of information to take in. So if you're sitting out there in the audience thinking. Oh gosh, I, well, I don't even know how these things make sense. Then you know, don't worry. We're going to run through some examples now. So hopefully, this information will will seep into you through the next just 20 minutes or so. Yeah, absolutely. So what we're going to do is Theo is going to take us through some examples. Uh, he's going to start off describing a, a particular invention, and we'd like you to tell us: Is it going to be patentable or not patentable? So you should be able to enter in the comments section just a yes or no. When Theo describes the invention, yes or no, do you think it's patentable or not patentable? Maybe even do you think it should be patentable or not patentable? Over to you, Theo. This is always the test for interactive ability. All right, so the first example, we have a washing machine. But it's not just any washing machine. This washing machine, you've created a new uh, program on it to rinse the rinse the clothes, add the detergent, so the clothes come out whiter than ever, or the 
the washing machine runs on like 50% less power. So if you described your invention as a method of washing clothes, as it says on the screen, using this new program, um, is it patentable? Oh my gosh, this is working. We actually have answers. <laughs> Lots of people saying yes. Great. Nice. Uh, Callum, would you want to take us through why? Reveal. Reveal. It is. It is, of course, patentable. This is the main example that I was just talking about. This is signpost one. You have an effect outside the computer. You're running a piece of machinery. You're just using a computer program for it. So this is the strongest argument that you're ever going to be able to make for why your software is patentable. If you can find a way of credibly arguing that this applies to you, go for it. But just to stress again, that effect outside of the computer needs to be in a technical area. So if you're running machinery like a washing machine, great. If your computer program is, say, making your business run better, that's not going to get you out of the exclusion. On to, Great. to another example. <clears throat> now, cast your minds back to the dark ages of 2009, I don't know, 2008. I guess this is peak, peak. Uh, technology. You've got your new brand new iPhone. It's just come out and they've got this new slide to unlock system. So those old keypad phones you don't need to press multiple keys. Now you just have to slide your finger along the bar on the screen. Now, what do we think? Is this system patentable? Still getting a lot of yeses. That's good. Do we have any dissent? Does anyone think it's not patentable? Or are we just setting this up so it seems like everything is? Oh, we've got a more nuanced one. Yes for US and Japan. Ah. Maybe yes. And you can't even be hedging your bets there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do you want to take us through this one, Callum? It's interesting. This is patentable. So what we have here, it's a, it's a GUI, it's a graphical user interface. And from one telling, all that is, is the presentation of information on a computer screen. So you may think, well, presentation of information, not patentable. Computer program, not patentable. But what is this actually doing? You're looking for user interaction. It's a way for the user to change the state of the, the phone, the computing device, from unlock to lock, or from lock to unlock. And what it's doing is it gives you a channel, and you pull that slider along the channel. So this display of information is guiding the user in interacting with the device to change the state of the device. And that guided interaction to reach a credible technical effect, interacting with the device to change its state does give it patentability. Now, you may well be familiar with this case. This is obviously Apple's slide to unlock case. It was litigated quite a lot around the world. And you may know that it was revoked as a patent, but it wasn't revoked for patentability. It made it over that first hurdle that we saw, but what killed it off was they found a prior art document that they thought the invention lacked an inventive step over. So it actually fell at the third hurdle. But in general, if you have some clever new way of users interacting with a device, it is worth considering a patent. 
That's a really good one, actually, Cam. Because when I first saw heard about this case, I was thinking, no way, it's just on a, it's just, it's just happening on the computer. How is it interacting outside of the computer? But when you put it like that, you know, it really opens the door into what you think is patentable and what isn't. Mm. So on the on the comment about the U.S., uh, I, I think you're probably saying that because the U.S. certainly used to be a lot more favorable to software. And maybe that's something we can talk about at the end, about how the US has changed its practice. But for now, should we move on to the next example here? Yeah, go for it. So if you can see on the left, we have a sort of representation of what's happening inside the computer. We have a little processor, we have a main memory, and we have a, a cache memory as well with its own controller. So if you have an invention that is, you know, you you're, you have an improved data structure uh, represents in your cache memory so that you can allow your computer to access data in, in the in, in the RAM, the read, read access memory, random access memory faster. Is that patentable? I mean, again, it's happening on the computer, but is it? A technical effect outside the computer, or is there another signpost we need to consider? Please post your answers now. Ooh, we've got a few no's. Interesting. Mm. A few yeses. Someone said, depends on how you draft claims. <laughs> <laughs> as, with ever, as with everything, I think. <laughs> we have a slide on that later, finally enough. For those who don't know, a, a claim of a patent is just a, a short sentence defining what your invention is. And it's what the uh, patent office will interrogate to endless degrees. It's been clarified. Not easy, but possible. Okay. All right, Cam, go on, take what's, us through. What's the verdict? The verdict is mostly yes, some initial yes. no's. So this is, this is a yes. This is that second signpost, it's computer architecture. So it's an effect on the internal operation of the computer, but it's at that architecture level, that basic level of operation of the computer. All of the computer programs, as you normally think of them, apps, as you might say on a phone, they can all access this and benefit from this invention. It's not just limited to, say, a word processor. So this is basic architecture level. It's making the computer better as a machine. This is going to be patentable. Cool. Uh, does anyone have any questions on that? The people who said no, maybe. We can always come back to it at the end if you prefer not to say anything now. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. All right. This is the uh, the fourth example, and conceptually similar to the previous example, except in this case instead of a new way of uh, accessing your your RAM memory. It's a new way of accessing uh, some underlying software. So imagine you have uh, a software program, and that program recalls other functions. And this example is an improved method of being access of being able to access those functions in another computer program. Now we're getting more into the rabbit hole of, of what is and what isn't possible. What, what, what are our thoughts here? Patentable, not so.
<laughs> Ooh, a lot of no's, some, some unsure, some saying it should be yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeses as well yeah i think i i uh associate mostly with the uh, i think it should be yes you know on a conceptual level you think this is something very technical that the patent system should should cover you know it's but then 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 you think oh well is is the law caught up in <laughs> how long has it been 50 years since it came into effect <laughs> give us the answer callum the good news is it is. It is patentable. So this is going to be a better computer. This sign for signpost. What you can think of it is really this is the software equivalent of making the basic hardware better. So a dynamic link library. It's accessible to all of the programs running on that computer. It gives them all a way of accessing common functions better. So that is again, an emphasis on the basic operation of the computer. It happens to be software rather than hardware, but it's still that basic level. It's making the machine better as a machine. And so it is patentable. Yeah, big emphasis on whether or not it's irrespective of a particular uh, function or program you're running, you know. It's got to make the computer as a whole better for all everything it's trying to run. Okay, is this the last example? I think it might be before we move on to some other stuff. Um, so yes, here we go. You're sitting at your desk in London and you're going to buy some stocks and shares through the London Stock Exchange. And you've come up with a great new method of being able to take those purchase orders and automatically processing those orders. So hopefully this makes your being able to buy and sell stocks faster, more efficient. Is this patentable? Technical? What do we think? A lot of no's, a couple of yeses. few more yeses. All right, take it away, Callum. I mean, I'm this afraid is... this is a no. What, we even with the computer no. there? Even with the computer there. So given that computers communicating with servers is known, the improvement here is just a better method of buying shares. Buying shares is a business method that is not excluded. That, sorry, that is excluded. So you, your computer program is just making a business method better that is not technical. Mm, yeah. The way it's set out as well doesn't help. The method could include a person pressing a button, buying shares, oh, it's very red signs, business, business. Um, yeah, and the rest of the wording isn't limited or telling you anything about, you know, whether or not it's technically uh, irrelevant of function. All right, speaking of which, we're now gonna discuss how maybe describing your invention or presenting your invention to the patent office. Um, so we have one option of a, a new method of sending a marketing notification when a customer enters a store. Very exciting. I'm sure, I'm sure that will go well down in investment pitches. And then we have another option, a new method of transmitting a notification to an electronic device based on location of the device. Rather dull. <laughs> Not as exciting or as glamorous as the first option. But which one do you think is more, more appealing to the patent office? 
I mean, away is set up. I think it's. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. I, think, I think it's very much option two. <laughs> Absolutely. So this is a very contrived example. They've all been quite contrived examples, but this one in particular. <laughs> Well, you've really got to imagine that what we've got here is some technically new process of sending that message. So what we're saying is, it may well be that your business is focused on sending a marketing notification. That's where you want to sell yourself. But actually, the technical advance you've made is in a new way of transmitting notifications. If you write your patent, if you write a claim that talks about marketing notifications, the patent examiner is just going to see marketing and say no. Whereas if you start off writing that application in a way that just sounds much more technical, draws out that actual technical advance you've made, you have a much better chance of getting a patent. This, so this is both telling the right story to the patent office and really thinking about what is that core advance that you've made? Possibly setting aside the, the core thoughts that you have as a business, what is that underlying technical method that you've come up with? This is an important, important reason why if you have questions about what you're doing to always ask a, a patent attorney because in a lot of cases, a lot of our clients won't recognize that they've done something that could be patentable or, or recognize that it could be told in a way to get a patent and this is a good example of that and now so, we're going to move on to some alternatives Take it away obviously down. there are times when you can't get a patent as we've just discussed or perhaps you don't want to get a patent because patents they are expensive and computer software patents in particular are probably going to be even more expensive because you're always in that gray area of the law. And that leaves so much more room for arguments for the patent examiner to, to come up with some objections that you have to overcome. And that's going to add to cost. So if you can't or don't want to get a software patent, what are your options? Well, the first one is copyright. Copyright, I'm sure you've all heard of. It's going to protect software code as if it was protecting a book. So the great benefit of this is it's automatic, it's free, it lasts an incredibly long time, life of the author plus 70 years, far longer than software is ever going to be useful, or a particular piece of software rather. But the big downside is you must show that an infringer has copied you. If they've come up with this, come up with this independently, it's not going to be infringement of copyright. So one way that you might want to to help prove that someone has infringed is by putting something like distinctive comments in your code. For those comments, they're not going to do anything to the code. They're not going to make your program inefficient in any way, but they're just odd things that are in there that you would never put in if you were coming up with this independently. So if you see your funny little comment in the code that someone else is using, you've, you can be pretty sure that they have copied from you. The other way that you might want to think about protecting your software is using trade secrets. And that is just not telling anyone about your invention. So the, the great benefit of this is it's free. And it's particularly good where no one can see how your invention works. So if you have some clever processing that you do and you do it all on your own servers, then no one can see that you can keep it a trade secret and that will last forever unless your invention gets out somehow. If it does get out, you have no protection. So if you're going to go down the trade secret route, you're going to need careful management. For example, make sure you're educating your employees so that they know what's a trade secret, know that they're not allowed to tell people about it or go off to another company and use it. It really takes a lot of management to make it work, but it can be a very powerful thing if you can make it work. So that free for trade secrets is really an inverted commas or that investment internally will cost some money. Absolutely. And of course, these aren't all like 
ores, you can have a combination of these things. So there could be some processing that you have only done on your servers that you keep a trade secret, some operation with the user device or how the user interacts that maybe you want a patent for, and your basic software code that you're going to use copyright for. And not forgetting the other IP rights, like trademarks, just to protect your branding and so on. So the most recent development in software we see a lot of is artificial intelligence. And this is really an evolving area of patent law. But in general, it follows the principles that we've just discussed. So you can think of artificial intelligence type inventions as splitting into different areas. At the top here, we have the, the pure algorithms, the data algorithms, the AI algorithms. They're basically mathematical algorithms, pure mathematics. It's not almost certainly not going to be patentable. Down at the bottom, you have architecture level or platform specific applications, or just the technical effect that you're using AI to achieve. And those technical applications are going to be patentable, just like all of the examples for normal software that we just discussed. And in the middle here, we have training algorithms. There, maybe you'll be able to get a patent, maybe you won't, depending on quite what, what it is. But you can see it as it's bringing that math, math, bringing those mathematical methods of the algorithms towards technical use. So maybe a patent, something to consider. Uh, one thing to think about is there is another requirement for a patent, and that's called sufficiency. So when you're writing a patent, you have to describe your invention in enough detail for a skilled person in your area to be able to just pick up the application and copy what you've done or replicate what you've done. So you do need to describe it in enough detail. So there is a question of how much detail do you need to put in to enable a skilled person to do your artificial intelligence invention. So for example, training data, obviously you don't want to put in your full set of training data, but you probably do need to put in something about the form of that training data, give some example, an example of row of training data, something like that, just to make sure it is sufficiently enabled. This, uh, this skilled person as well is just uh, an engineer who's working in the field of artificial intelligence. So there's no need to go into too much depth and there's definitely no need to write, like put in specific lines of code or anything like that. Just something that gives them a, a push in the right direction. Absolutely. So that is, that is it for a quick run through kind of areas where you might be able to get patents. Just again, the key message is you can patent some software. Don't be put off from thinking about patents. And if it's, if it's some software that you think is really good, it's really important to your business, then do find a friendly patent attorney. Ask them whether you think it's worth pursuing. So we're now open to any questions. But just to say, if there is anything, any real specific uh, questions you have or anything you don't want to talk about in a public forum, do feel free to email me. My email address is down there. Any questions?